Hello and welcome everyone to the Rebox Studio show. And today is um, a special session because I have with me not only my guest, but someone who is also going to give you a chance to win her books. So before we bring her along, let me just uh, welcome you once more wherever you're watching from. My name is Krista Gun, and I've been having this uh, live stream sessions for, let's say, more than a year. And I started this back when the pandemic started because I wanted it as a way for me to introduce uh, friends and people that I know and people who can bring valuable knowledge to all of us. So today is a session whereby we're going to learn all about investing and investing in the sense of you being your own fund manager. So we're going to learn from a former fund manager how to do so and get a chance to win her books. So if you just join us, welcome. Please put it, please put in the comments where you're from and you know whether you've been enjoying our sessions, whether you've benefited from our sessions. And without much further ado, let's bring on Lim Mei Ching, our guest for today. Hi, Krista. Hi, Mei Ching. How are you today? Oh, great. Thank you for allowing me to be in your show today. And you're a very special guest because this is the final live stream that I'm doing for this year. So you're the final guest for the year before, oh, so we, wrap up, before we wrap up for the year because we're all like taking a break. And today you're going to share with us some interesting things from your book. And of course, for viewers, they have a chance to win your book. But before that, Mei Ching, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to writing your book and what why did you write the book? Okay. Um, basically, I have been in the fund management, uh, investment banking industry for the past 12 years. I started off in uh, 2007. I joined OSK Investment Bank as a management associate, as a trainee. So I was rotated to a few departments like corporate finance, research, asset management, and debt capital market. Then after that, I went to rating agency and I also joined uh, FIM Asset Management and Gibraltar BSN as a fund manager. So in totality, I have been the investment banking for 12 years. I have been in the buy side and sell side, meaning buy side means asset management, sell side means um, equity research. Whereby, you know, sometimes when you read research reports, you get analysts who write research reports. So I, I used to be one of them writing research reports. And uh, and and after I left a fund management industry last year, um, around August, and um, I thought I wanted to write something to share with the public, something that is more relatable and sharing my experience both from the buy side and the sell side of equity research. So I came up with a book called Be Your Own Fund Manager. Basically, this book is about fundamental analysis and technical analysis, and it combines both FA and TA into a book and also include portfolio management, how fund managers actually manage a portfolio of stocks. The, diff the unique thing about this book is that um, it's full of colors um, and uh, a lot of examples and also some humor. I injected some humor so that it's not so dull because um, there are a lot of investment book out there that is all plain black and white, but mine is full of colors. And I'm sure if you read the book, you will laugh about it as well. So currently I'm working um, with my family doing um, margarine, manufacturing margarine. And also I'm a part-time trainer with August Learning. And I, I do conduct CPE courses under Security Commission. And I'm glad to be on the show today. Yeah. So your background is uh, on this investment and all that for the longest time, right? But when you were uh, in that in career, I like, would we'll call it a career, right? Did you enjoy it? In a way, I enjoy it because I meet a lot of friends along the way. And I think um, I still keep in touch and till today and I learned a lot along the way. To be very frank, I used to be a very quiet person. So investment banking actually helped me to open up to give presentation. It forced me to be uh, more um, outspoken. And um, I learned a lot of things because 
by managing a fund and also researching on a fund, uh, researching on companies. I get to visit a lot of companies around Malaysia. I've been to from North, from Penang, all the way to Johor. We visited factories. We go down to the floor and see how uh, companies uh, grow their business. And the management are usually quite kind. They bring us around and they show us how they do their business. And also we compare their business compared to the peers. And then we uh, try to um, calculate a target price for the businesses that we actually analyze. So, yeah, I think I learned a lot along the way. And... Coming from asset management and research, I think it gives me a very good foundation because um, research is a place whereby, you know, when you read research reports from various investment banks, um, they write research reports like reporters. We actually go down to the uh, management and ask them questions and then we write down, uh, we ask, ask them questions and then after that we write research report based on our analysis with some models. And then asset management is different in the sense that they don't write they write research reports for internal circulation only and they, um, they manage a fund for the client, uh, institutional funds and also for retail funds. So uh, basically it's a very different uh, ball game because research is on the sell side and asset management is on the buy side. So I thought that it'd be good if I can share my experience both from the buy and sell side in a book and how actually fund managers and how research analysts uh, analyze stocks in a very um, more creative manner because the books is full of cartoons and colors and uh, it's it's a different approach if you say that you want to learn investing and you want to you do not know where to start then i think uh, probably my book Your is book. a good place yeah to it's yeah. a good place to start uh, yeah. where to buy uh, well you can go to shopee it's uh you just click the word be your own fund manager and you will see a few uh, lists of uh, be your own fund manager in shopee yeah, it's okay. also available in bookstores like MPH, Kinokuniya, uh, Gerak Budaya at the moment. Okay, so before we get into uh, what you want to share with us today, let me say some quick hellos to some people who have just put their comments in. So, hi Marika. Marika is a friend of mine all the way from the Philippines. Hi Marika, glad to see you here with us. And there's uh, Ong, uh, not sure whether it's your friend or my friend. Sometimes people come on Facebook with, you know, different names and, you know, some people use their spouse's Facebook uh, profiles to access us. So I get all kinds of friends logging in. So I hope I know you, Ong. But if I don't know, maybe you are, you are Mei Ching's friend. So welcome. So today, since we're, we're uh, talking about investing, uh, I just like to let everyone know that they will get a chance to win your book if uh, yeah, if they're lucky enough or if they are quick enough or if they pay attention. So that's the key, that's the clue for all of you. So you have to pay attention because Making is going to share some very interesting information with all of us. And I think this is a very apt topic for now because a lot of us are looking at different avenues, right? I mean, different avenues to either earn money, make money, do something with our money. So I think this is a great starting point. And how long did it take you to write the book, Meiting? It took me about a year and I believe the pandemic helps me in writing it, in speeding up because there's nowhere to go. I was locked down in the <laughs> house and uh, it's so boring. The pandemic actually is a good thing. Um, well, good thing the blessing, like blessing for some of us, like, okay. I mean, for there's some people who are really struggling, and we really yeah, empathize really sad, those yeah. people, yeah. It's but really for sad. some of us, like we're at home, we we don't know what we can do. I mean, well, in your case, you wrote a book, right? Yeah, so I that's think a great great milestone. Thank you. Okay, then there's you. I think this is your friend, Leon. Hi, Leon. Okay. Welcome to the show, Leon. So, you, everyone here who's uh watching us, please leave a comment or please... I'm not mistaken, Leong is a fund manager as well, so... Oh, okay. So all, all your fund manager friends are here to support you. That's great. Okay, so let's get started with today's uh, information sharing. So shall I just uh, bring the slides up? Sure. Okay. Um, so as a start, this is a disclaimer. This presentation is only for educational purposes only and we do not offer any advice on buy or sell recommendation on any particular stocks and therefore not liable for any trading and investment decision. Next slide. So it's good to get that uh, mentioned first, right? Yeah. So where, how do we start investment? Where, where, what to do? Okay, like 
this crystal here, you know, some people may value it $1, some people may value $2. All of us have different valuation on certain things because our assumptions are different. So what can we use to guide us? Well, we can use fundamental analysis. Fundamental analysis, or called FA, is used to calculate the intrinsic value or fair value of the stock. And it's actually very subjective because I and you have different assumptions. That's why if you look at research houses, the target prices of, his, of a particular stock can range very widely. And it's usually used for long-term investment. And analysts usually analyze the stock using fundamental, fundamental analysis, uh, such as they analyze the profit and loss, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement, and then they derive target prices based on their assumption and also include uh, economic outlook and industry analysis. So if the share price is less than the target price, then it's a buy. But if the share price is more than the target price, then it's a sell. So FA basically is fundamental analysis. Basically, if you want to get what's the intrinsic value of a stock. So next slide. Now, this is a summary of fundamental analysis. So some people ask me, hey, how to start, uh, how to start to, 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 to analyze a stock? Well, I used some of these criteria, uh, such as low valuation, low PE, or low price earnings growth ratio of below one, because you can see that sometimes even um, low PE stock can go lower and high PE stock can go higher. So sometimes if the growth is higher than the PE, whereby the PEG is below one, then it may, can, it may still fulfill the criteria of a buy list. And then another criteria is whether the company has strong earnings growth and whether the company is a growing industry. And of course, it must be attractive among its peers because why do I, put, why do I want to buy this particular company compared to the rest of the other company? And of course, we want to buy companies with strong balance sheet and low gearing uh, because it would be able to weather the financial crisis or, and also usually good balance sheet companies are cash cow companies who's able to generate more dividends and, and there's no need for a cash call. And we also want to buy companies with good track record and good management is also very important. Um, now at the moment, ESG issue is very important whereby ESG is environmental, social and corporate governance, whether the company actually manage it in a, well, in a good manner and, and, and adopt ESG into their business. Lastly is dividend yield. So then there's a question, do I need to fulfill all these criteria before I buy a stock? Not necessary. Uh, you have more criteria fulfilled, then it's better. Lah. But if you, I mean, even your own partner, right? Your partner didn't fulfill all criteria, but you still buy into it, right? So so, so that's a... That, that's a good yeah, analogy. You, you, don't <laughs> you don't have to tick all the boxes. You don't have to yes, be 100%. Yeah, Krista, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to tick all the boxes. This is just a guidance. In fact, even after fulfilling all, it, all of it, the stock can still fall. So it doesn't guarantee a return, but it's just a guidance, a disclaimer again. Yeah. Yeah. So can I ask this question based on this slide, right? When you're talking about uh, this good management, what does yeah. that mean? It's like, do you look at the board? Do you look at the yes. CEO? Do you look at the yes. CEO, CFO? Yes, just like Red Box Studio. Who are the people behind <laughs> Crystal? Are they good management? Are they? Do they know what they're doing? Are they just sitting on the board because, because you know, because of any reason why they're sitting on the board? Do they know? Are, because they are the drivers of the company. Do they really know understand what they're doing? And um, and who are the people they employ? It's the people that drive the company. It's not just the management alone. The people and the management and the employees all has to be taken into account in order to define what is good management. And of course, differ, the good management may differ among people as well. You may say it's a good management. I may say, I may say it's not a good management. So it's a different perception. It's, it's quite okay. subjective, right? Sometimes yeah, it's very subjective. Yeah. yeah. So so that's also the case, right? Sometimes people say, "Oh, this is a good management." Or this, uh, these are good people, right? But we all we all know that good people do leave a company, right? Yeah. Good, good people do actually, you know, eventually they do leave when they resign and all that. So that's also quite a subjective thing, like, But I just wanted to ask that because this uh definition of good, I mean, it varies from person to person. It varies from people to people, right? agree 
Yeah. It's a very subjective okay, thing. So, yeah, it's very subjective. And then, but this, okay, let's uh, look at uh, this one, the one, the first one, low forward price earnings ratio or price earning growth with ratio below one. So I think you do have a formula for this, right? Yeah, Is more details in, in my book. Yeah, there's a formula for it. More details are in my yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. So for people who are really beginner, beginner, they'll be like, what? How? So I, I have to let people know that like, there is a formula for this like So it's not just yeah. like, you know, yeah. you can Google it up. Like, I mean, this is also very... But even this is very subjective. What is low? You mm. know, what is, yeah. what is low? Like a price, you go to a shopping mall, you buy yeah. an item. Yeah. What is low to a person may not be low to another person. So it's very subjective. Yeah. So that also means at the end of the day, the decision uh, is on the person who's investing, right? So it is really that person's uh, what they believe to be low. Yes. Even though some people may consider it not low. Yes. Okay. So I just wanted to clear that because sometimes certain terms, we use them so often, we think that everyone understands, but maybe certain terms need to be clarified so that we at least we know what it means and whether or not later we decide uh, when in a question session, I mean, this is also a chance for all of you who are watching. If you want to ask a question, uh, please have that question ready. Uh, anytime you can pop them in the comments and I'll pull them up for matching to uh, answer or to reply. And then who knows, you might win her book and then you might find out all about the formulas, everything that she's talking Actually, about. Actually, the today. formula, even you don't buy my book, you can just Google it. It's in YouTube, yeah. it's in Google. Yeah, so... Yeah. So it's if not, it's not a, it's yeah. like a mystery thing, like yeah. But no, no, it's, but it's a you can thing. you can read, yeah. But you can read her book and you can find out more because she. Uh, one thing about your book, Mei that's interesting is that you do give um examples, right? And I think the examples are the ones that help people understand even more, not just the technical information, but they are examples inside your book. Okay, so can we move on to the next slide? Sure. Okay. So yeah. After finding out the intrinsic value of a company, we also would like to know more about technical analysis. You know, nowadays, a lot of people read chart. So chart is technical analysis. Basically, charts don't lie. Human can lie, charts don't lie. Charts tell a story. It gives you a better entry and exit level for the stock. And it's based on a historical trend. It's usually used for trading purposes, with short-term uh, trading and... By using technical analysis, we see whether the buyers is in control or the sellers in, is in control. And basically, there's a psychological pricing because everybody look at technical analysis. So some other how is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And therefore, we should take into account technical analysis and chample together with our fundamental analysis so that we become FATA FATA. FATA in Chinese is called uh, FATA, you know, it's uh, yeah. prosper 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 yeah, prosperous, yeah. prosperity. But it doesn't mean prosperous. that I apply FATA for strategy, I become FATA. Yeah. A lot of people apply but still don't become FATA. So it's just yeah. it's just <laughs> a joke, you know? It's just a, yeah, it's just called a FATA strategy, but it doesn't mean that you apply both. Like this year market has been so bad, our Malaysian KLCI. So even if you apply FATA strategy, there will be some stocks that you don't make money as well. So yeah. So then in this case, would you uh, say that combining both would be ideal? Yes, the next slide will show it. Okay, so do you want me to move to the next slide? Yes. Okay. So look at this slide, it's called FATA strategy. <laughs> okay, so both indicators have to be strong in order you enter a trade. Your FA and your TA have to be strong, just like I use two hands. One hand is FA, one hand is TA. And if I chumpo together, I, I hold it together, my analysis becomes stronger. Just like I use a fork and spoon. If I use a fork and spoon, definitely I can hold my food better. So if it's both strong, then buy and good luck. But if fundamental is strong and technical is weak, wait for a reversal in the share price. What if fundamental is weak, technical is strong? Avoid as there are better stocks out there. If both of both also weak, I know to see lah. Just ignore it and and just leave it out from your stock list. So this okay. is just a guidance, yeah. Yeah. For those of you who are watching, if you want to ask any questions, pop them in the chat because that's a chance for you to win her book. Okay, so that's that's the. 
the key thing. Okay, so, diversification. Yeah, yeah. this is What's very this important. Uh, if you buy, you need trust. You realize there are a lot of stocks inside, and it's usually from various companies and various sectors. So why do we diversify? We want to reduce concentration risk. It's basically like don't put everything, all the eggs into one basket. We spread out the risk. And as a suggestion, I probably recommend like 5% per stock basis at the point of entry. And you overweight or underweight sectors according to your market reading. So if you buy like 5%, you probably like to have 20 stocks, 5 times 20. If you think that 20 is too much for you, then probably can reduce to 10. And your each stock exposure is about 10%. I mean, you can actually... But what I want to encourage is that investors should start to diversify instead of concentrating on one or two stocks. But then there's an argument. If I concentrate on one or two stocks, I'll be able to make big gains if I'm right. But what if I'm wrong? I think most important is to preserve the capital of the fund. Capital preservation is key to portfolio management. Capital appreciation is only secondary. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm quite risk adverse person. I do not want to put all my money into one or two stocks. If you want to do that, you may make very huge gain in one year, but next year, what happens if you are wrong? We cannot be lucky all the time. So it's important to diversify. Just like your nasi lemak, you know, we have your nasi, we have your sambal, we have your telo, we have your ikan bilis, we have your what cucumber. So if even if my nasi is not nice, but if my sambal is nice, my nasi lemak still tastes good, right? So yeah, uh, uh, yes. uh, that's, that's, that's interesting. That's an interesting of wooding, yeah. yes. Yeah, at least something balances out or something at least yeah. gives you the extra oom, right? Yeah. Okay, so in this case, right, when you were just now talking about appreciation, capital mm. appreciation, yeah. Uh, so in your case, your own personal is your own personal principle is that it's better to diversify rather than yes. placing it in one or two uh, stocks. Stocks. Okay. Yes. But generally, when you are, um, you know, talking to people and all that, what do they normally do? Is there a like um, thing that most yeah. Malaysians do? I think most Malaysian, most investor will tell you the stock that make money. They don't hmm. tell you stocks that lose money. Okay. But, yeah. So we don't really know what they buy. They would they will hide the stocks that they lose money because it's an ego thing. So okay. you won't. But if you look at a lot of fun fact sheet of unit trust funds, you realize that there are top holdings and they don't have one or two stocks. They have a number of stocks in their portfolio. Mm -hmm. And the number of stocks, it doesn't have to be just one sector, meaning I can buy across sector. So if you buy just one sector, just imagine that industry is not doing well, then your whole portfolio will fall to in tandem as well. Mm -hmm. If Of course, if you're right, it's good. Lah. But what if you're wrong? I'm just trying to reduce the level of risk. Okay, so in this case, for instance, if the technology sector, some people love technology sector a lot, yes, right? Yes. Because yes. that's like, oh, everything is towards technology. So people want yes. to invest in that. So yes. in your case, your your way of looking at it is that don't just put all your money into the technology sector. Yes. Look into other sectors as well. Yes. Right? Could be manufacturing, could yeah. be other kinds of uh, yeah. businesses out yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. There is a question uh, from Usha. So can we take that question first, Meiching, before sure. we continue? Sure. Okay, so Usha's question is, some say low gearing means the company is not spending enough on growth or innovation. What is your view? Hmm. Interesting question, Usha. That means they have a lot of cash and they're not spending on innovation. Uh, true. It's true to a certain extent. That means they have a lot of cash. They're not spending on growth. But sometimes, not growing is a good thing. You can open... Okay, my parents used to run business and they can open a lot of outlets. But if the outlets are not doing well, what's the point? Most important thing is having money enough to weather a crisis. Like this pandemic, a lot of us didn't foresee it. And companies that we have gearing are not being able to weather the storm. 
they have to do more cash call, need to borrow more money, which is very dangerous. So I do agree to a certain extent that sometimes keeping, keeping too much cash is not a good thing. But if you look from another point of view, when there's a crisis, cash is king. Cash will be able to give you the ability to weather a crisis, which is very important. And the ability to give you dividends because they have enough cash. I hope that answers your question, Usha. That is uh, Mei Ching's view on low gearing. So, uh, Mei Ching, if you could, could you explain a little bit the definition of low gearing? Maybe for some people, they may oh, not understand that. Low yeah. gearing is basically there's um, a lot of cash, lah, basically. Yeah, more, a lot of cash in their... Uh, maybe their debts is very low. Hmm. Low debts. Low, low level of debts, yeah. Okay. And I think he, someone here mentioned... Uh, Tony Pang. Low gearing could also refer to scaling up without boring to pump up growth. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comment. And then, oh, we, we have another comment too. Interesting. Uh, if an investor bought the stock at a very high price, should he or she cut loss or hold, assuming company and industry have good future prospect? What is your view? Hmm. Firstly, when you say you bought at a very high price, meaning that the valuation is very high, why do you enter when you know the share price is high? Cut loss, I'm pretty sure that you mean that the share, the share you have bought really lose money. So I have a cut loss policy of 25%. I try not to let it fall more than 25%. So just say I buy 5% of my portfolio, I buy a particular stock and I lose money. If I cut at 25%, I only lose like 1.25%, 1. which is very minimal. So it's easy for me to make a comeback in my fund. So cutting loss is very important. In fact, I'll be going on the next slide that cutting loss is very important. That's why sometimes robots can do better than humans sometimes because they have no feeling. If it's a threshold to cut loss, they cut loss. But because we have feeling, we have attachment, we think that this one sure can jalan one, sure can go one. But it doesn't jalan and it go downward how? What should you do? So cut loss is very important. Assuming that the com com company has good prospect, future prospect, probably because you already entered the trade, that's why you think there's a future good prospect. Maybe you ask your family or your friends, do they really think that this company has a good future prospect? It may differ according to other people as well. So um what is good prospect to you in fact when you open a business definitely you think it's a good prospect that's why you open the business but when you are in it already you have no choice bad prospect also you carry on and you do not want to cut loss because you want to you cannot take the, the losses which is very dangerous um i just want to mention that investing it doesn't mean that you definitely make, make money if that's the case everybody will be rich but it doesn't, even if you, F, you employ this FATA strategy, you can still lose money. So it's very important to cut loss. In fact, so it's not a, it's not a guarantee, like, right? We, we can't say like, yeah, you yeah. really know FA and TA, right? Doesn't mean it's a guarantee no. that you, you know, will make money in the, no. in the market. Yeah. No. So in this, in this um, question or comment, so it means that uh, people should not buy when it's at a very high price, correct? Yes, yes. But what is so, high is also very subjective. So yeah. use your FA uh -huh. to find the target price, to know the intrinsic value of a stock before going in, so that you know at what level you should enter. You should only enter if your intrinsic value is higher than your current share price, or the fair value or the target price is higher than the current share price. If your share price is above the intrinsic value, then don't buy. For instance, if this pen, say, is worth two ringgit, I enter at two fifty, then, then the chances of losing is there. But if I enter at one ringgit and the fair value is two ringgit, then there's upside potential. So that's why it's very important before you enter into trade to know the intrinsic value, the fair value of the stock before entering. So that's mm -hmm. why we should use fundamental analysis in our stock selection to find the fair value of a particular stock. 
Mm, okay, great advice. Okay, now we can move on. Uh, hope that answers your question, Ong. Uh, the next slide. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so just now fits in losses. exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly like what you were talking about. Yeah, I think, you know, cutting loss seems like a simple thing, but not everyone can do it because we are all humans. Robot can do better than us, definitely. And if you really, really think that's really a good potential and you really sayang to cut loss, then maybe you cut half like, at least. But try not to average down, like, if possible, unless technically there's a rebound. Because if you average down, meaning you go down, you buy more, you go down, you buy more, what will happen? You'll be more deeply attached to the stock and you do not know how to get out. Now, everyone knows how to enter a stock. It's very simple. Just buy. Mm -hmm. But do we know how to get out? And that's the key to portfolio management is when to get out. Even getting out at the loss is also very crucial. It's, re it's very crucial because it limits your losses. Now, when you cut loss, you're actually buying an insurance for your fund. So my suggestion, do not be egoistic. Admit your mistake. I, for one, have cut loss as well. I've never been right all the time. I'm only human. If the person tell you they never lose money before, I I, I really doubt so because... <laughs> don't, don't really the, trust what that person is saying, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just being very... Very listed, frank. pragmatic, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just being... I'm just telling the truth. Yeah. yeah. Don't be egoistic. Yeah. So one of the way to do a, be a good portfolio manager is to be humble. Humble in the sense that I am wrong. I can be wrong because I'm human. Yeah. So it's fine to be wrong. So long as you have more stocks that is doing well compared to stocks that is in the losses, then ultimately you still make money because as I said, my, my Nasla Mark doesn't just consist one or two stocks. My Nasla Mark consists of many stocks. So I can afford to lose even if one of it doesn't turn out well. Okay, let's go to the next slide, right? Oh yeah, we must know what we are buying. Some people just hunt up any stock because people say so. So actually, when you buy a stock, we have to look through the websites or annual reports. We have to study the company. And it'd be good if you can buy stocks with one or two few one or few business structure. At least you understand what you buy, what you are buying. Even when you are doing business, it's important that you understand the business structure so you know when to exit. What what does and that mean? Business structure. Maybe okay. Just say I buy a consumer company. I must at least know what they're doing. Study about them. And by studying about them, just say I know there's a slow in demand for that particular consumer product. I know that it's time to get out. If I don't even know what I'm buying, I just know it's ABC company, then I'm just blindly going in without knowing the knowing the in and out of the company. It's just like when you're doing business, you don't you don't just become a partner to a business just because you like that particular company for no reason. But because you really believe there's industry growth, the company is going to do well, the company has good management, the company has good potential. So basically, you must know the in and out of the company. And once you, once you buy the company, don't just keep it aside. You have a, this, a watch, li watch list of stocks to keep track of it. So basically, you still take care of it like a baby. Don't just buy and then chuck it away, you know. Loss or lose also, make or lose money also don't know. So it's very important. To so it means more. that to me, what I hear you saying is that when you buy into a stock, you must at least know how that business is run, what they produce, what, what they are selling, right? Yes. Instead of just saying, I'm just going to dump my money to this stock and that's it. And hopefully, you know, I'm going to make some money out of it. So at least you follow closely what yes. that business or industry, uh, what's happening in that industry, so you get an idea 
of whether and probably this is also good right i mean it also tells you when you should get out of it yes or when you should start uh, adding more or investing should, more money yes. yeah okay. agree okay. totally agree yeah then uh this one is read more and do your own research meaning that covers that right yeah so you can but does it but does it mean okay then the other thing i want to ask you does it mean that just say you have 10 right yeah uh 10 different stocks yeah then wouldn't that take up a lot of time for you to be like watching reading and i mean not, not analyzing but at least watching reading following up on these different companies yeah and it's true businesses? to be very frank ever since i joined the investment banking industry i never stopped reading <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, no is choice. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? It, 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 can, um, it can be a good thing too because I get to improve my English. Hmm. Because I come from... Um, uh, as, as The more you read, you gain more knowledge. So you when you buy stock, it's not just about buying stock. But also you gain knowledge along the way. It's like a sub-benefit. Because you have position in the company... You will tend to read more about the company. And, and you tend you, to put more of your focus into that particular Yes, business, and people talk right? about the company because you are a shareholder. You somehow, you know a lot of things about the company because mm. you read about the company and you don't just read about the company, you also read about the industry. Mm. Okay. Whether the industry is on uptrend, downtrend. And you can also discuss with your family or friends so that you have an another opinion. When I and was looking at some... Yeah. yeah, sorry. That, that, that makes for a very fun family dinner. <laughs> you can get to talk about so, businesses that you invest in. Uh, hopefully, you don't argue. You don't end up arguing. <laughs> yeah. Because everybody has different thoughts of things. Because yes. that's why there's no right or wrong. You know, That's why there's a buyer, there's a seller. Yeah, uh, it, It's not buyer all the way or seller all the way. And it's only when buyer and seller match, that's how you come up to a price. Yeah. So... For those of you who just joined us, remember we're giving away Meijing's books. So what I want you to do is you just ask a question. Okay, ask a question and we'll pick the most interesting questions to win her books. I'm not telling you how many books we're offering. So we'll see which are the more interesting ones, right, Meijing? Interesting question, interesting comment. So it's not only questions. So if you have comments, just say you have your opinion and you have a comment. Please also add in your comments. And then later, we will uh, pick the winners from this session, especially those who are here joining us live. Lah, okay. So if you're watching this on the replay, I'm so sorry you don't have a chance to win the book, but it's only for people who join us live. So, okay. Uh, what were you saying just now, Meijing, before I cut you off? Forgotten. Now I will go to the next <laughs> slide. <laughs> okay. Maybe later when you remember you. So that's what I was saying. It is actually um, like you have to put, some, put in some effort you know, to take care of all, right? When investing in certain businesses, stocks, you have to really take care of them on your own. Well, control of emotions, so difficult. I've seen some people, wow, the share price crashed really. How, how, how I want to sell? Scared, mm. scared. Mm. So we have to be very detached. So I would advise if you want to invest in stock, you have must have good brain power, good control of emotion and also mindfulness, you know. Why do you enter and trade? You probably ask, need to ask yourself. And that's mm. why it's very important to know the fair value of a stock. If you know the fair value of a stock, then if it crashes, you, yeah. know, you, you know you wouldn't need to sell because it will eventually probably go right. back to the fair value. Yeah. So, so control of emotion. If you have fundamental analysis, I think you will have better control of emotion. And But control of emotion is actually very difficult to... I mean, everyone is different, you know, different risk I mean, tolerance. I will also say that logic is logic, but until your own money is on the line, right? Yes. People get, people start to feel fearful. And I know friends, some friends I know who, they sound very logical, but yeah. when it comes to letting go, or like you say, cutting losses, yes. Yes. they feel very much afraid to do that. Because they have probably, when it goes down, by some much. <laughs> Yeah, so that's why diversification, as I said, limit to 5% per stock. Mati, mati 5%, you know, don't go above that. So there'll be less attachment. So when you have so many stocks, definitely there'll be less attachment. Yeah, okay. 
So, so if but, you want the, to but this is a good. This is a good. Yeah, it's a good um thing to to talk about also because this is usually it is like this. Like when you are looking from the outside, right? It's yeah. easy for you to say, oh, you know, you should do this. You should try yeah. this. But once your money is in there, and you know that either your money is shrinking or your money is going or gone. Yeah. that's when all this fear start to come in and that's where it's ha- very hard to think straight so, so that is where want, yeah. yeah agree yeah. so that's why never borrow money to buy a stock <laughs> it should good be advice the, you should good be advice. whatever I put money in the stock I'm prepared to lose it so, so I can have excess it. money right it's my excess money even if something happened to my stock hmm. I'm still alright the next day because it's not all your life savings, right? It's yeah, not it's not my all, all. Yeah, it's not going to be my life saving. Because if you borrow money and you invest, you are forced to sell at a very depressed price because you need to return the money back to the lender, which is very dangerous. Yeah. So very important, never borrow money to invest. Because I can tell, I I can tell you a, a personal story. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Many Cherry. many years, many many years ago. Yeah. I had someone tell me. Oh, you can just go and borrow money from a bank if you want to buy this <laughs> stock. Yeah. And this person, mind you, uh, is someone who knows finances. And okay. that person is advising me that. So I kind of roll my eyes at him. <laughs> I'm like, are you sure? I mean, coming from someone who is from the finance and accounts background to okay. ask people to borrow money to buy a stock. So I thought yeah. that was really bad advice. Yeah. Regardless of where, what his background is, I really thought that it was something not good to tell people. Yeah. I think ethically, we should tell people stocks is not a guaranteed return. Mm. You know, And if you borrow money, are you sure that you can make better return from the cost of borrowing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Okay, next slide. So, yeah, cash is king. Raise cash level. Sometimes, if you do, do not have any idea, probably it's a good idea. Probably it means that the market is a bit toppish. And some people may say, oh, I do not know when to enter the market. Well, we can stagger the fund. For instance, just say I have 10000 and I want to invest 10000 in a stock. Maybe why not I stagger it to five months? Every month, I put 2000 2 times 5. By the fifth month, I have 10000 in in the stock. So what I mean by staggering is that this month I put two about two thousand, next month I put two thousand. So you you do not need to time the market in that manner. And sometimes if you think the market is a bit choppish, you can raise the cash level. Taking profit is fine. So when the market is crash again, you have money to enter. If you are fully invested, you have no more money, then you may not be able to buy, even though you know it's the 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 company is trading at very low valuation because yeah so cash is king it's fine not to have any stock in your portfolio you know if you think the market is toppish don't go and chase after the stock as i want to say again it's not a guaranteed return out there yeah so cash is king in times of crisis so it means that for instance if i plan to invest ten thousand into this uh abc company yeah i, I shouldn't go in with all my 10,000. I can go in like yeah. 2K, 2K, 2K yeah. for the next five months so that at least I stagger my yeah. investment in that particular yes. company. Yeah. So that, that allows me to do what? That allows me to actually watch the market a little bit? or um, In a way, because just say you do not know whether the market is, you know, if the market is on the topish side or in the or near bottom. Yeah. So, and also maybe also you don't feel so you don't need to invest <laughs> in one goal, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. instead of not, not so 10, overwhelmed, 000, right? Yeah, not so overwhelmed. Yeah, that's the word. Yeah, not so overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah overwhelmed because suddenly you just pump in 10k. Okay, yeah. so for this in this point in time, I just want to bring up Usha's question. Uh she wants to know, can you further elaborate on what investing five percent per stock means? Okay. That's a very good uh question. Assuming I have I want to invest. 100,000 into stock. Just say I have 100,000. Just say 5% of 100,000 is 5,000 each. Show. Right? 5, 000, 5% of 100,000 is 5%. Uh, 5% of 100,000 is 5,000. So 
I try not to go above 5,000. Plus minus lah. I try not to buy 6,000, 7,000. I try to be below 5,000 per stock. Does that clarify the question? Means so that what means that you you know your max lah, right? Yeah, you know my max, you, yeah. You know your max, so your max is just say five thousand for this particular stock means that's all I'm going to put in. Five thousand out, out right. of yeah, out of your hundred thousand, yeah. five percent. Yeah. So it depends yeah. depends on where what your hundred percent is, right? So some yeah, people's hundred percent could be one million. Ten thousand. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, one million. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's because very, like you say yeah. it's subjective, right? Like we don't yeah, know what is low as high. So for some people, one million is like, well, I got one million to yeah. do some investing. Or some people yeah. say, I only have ten thousand, only have yeah. hundred thousand, or you know, fifty thousand, yeah. whatever. So that percentage depending on the amount that you want to invest yes. in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Usha. That's a good one because sometimes, yeah, like one. I, yeah, because sometimes we also don't know, like. Okay, we were talking about investing for beginners, right? I don't know what's the level of most people, but I think investing for beginners is always interesting because all of us come in with this idea that we don't really don't know anything. And because you're a former fund manager, you have more insights, more things that you can share with us. So that's that's why this is a good chance for any one of you, you want to ask a question, here's a former fund manager and she's she's here to answer your questions. So that's great. Okay. Then we can continue, right? Okay. Yeah, I think I repeated myself. So don't borrow money to invest. So, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I just I just gave an example. Don't, yeah, don't borrow don't, money to. Yeah. It's a very dangerous thing. Yeah. Yeah, and then then when you borrow money, I don't think you can think logically either. Yes, you have no holding power, which is very important, because the stock has is very volatile. If you have holding power, you may ride through it, ride through the storm. Okay. Yeah. Next one. So I guess, yeah, so this is my book. This is the link. Yeah. And oh, sorry. Any, just, sorry. Yeah. Any question and answers? Too. Yeah. So now's your chance to ask questions because we have about another 13 minutes or so. So what I want to do this format is uh, a quick and easy format. So if you want to ask Mei Ching any question that's, well, also it's within the topic, but maybe something that you didn't talk about or maybe something you talked about, but they want further elaboration, please feel free to put in your question. So before you do that, um, I want you, so there's this criteria that I want you to do. Okay, put in three of your friends' names because why? We want them to also find this replay. And when you find this replay, this is actually good for them to review or to just watch, right? So put three friends' names and then put in your question. Or if you don't have a question, it's, it's fine also. Put in your comment. So I'm not too sure whether the audience today watching, they're all fund managers or former fund managers or people who are very well-versed uh, in investing. But I really do encourage you to ask uh, Mei Ching questions because she really... Uh, has years of experience in this industry and she really knows uh, really the technical stuff. Okay, so here's, while we're waiting for the question to come in, here's my take on the book. Uh, Mei Ching kindly sent me a copy of a book and I read through it and I that is how I decided to invite her to be on the Redbox Studio show because I felt that what she wrote in her book was really highly technical uh, even uh, you know when i read it i felt it was highly technical but at the same time given that it's highly technical it's also accessible meaning that as a lay person uh it's it's something that people can understand because of her examples so that is why i thought hey wouldn't it be great to get her on uh, and to get her to answer any questions you have so if you always wanted to ask a fund manager right or maybe even if it's just a fun like what's the job like as a fund manager like she mentioned that at the beginning of this uh, show ask her questions like that and then you know and the best questions will win her book it's as simple as that so start putting in your questions so we have 10 more minutes so let's uh wait for those questions so in the meantime let me ask you something Mei Ching. 
Yes. What was the most interesting uh, thing for you when you were writing this book? Because I know you come with experience. I know you have years of experience in this, being a fund manager and all that. But what was the most interesting or perhaps even the most challenging thing when it came to writing this book? Um, there's sometimes there are days that there's just no idea and I just leave it hanging there. So I was also afraid that I can't finish up the book based on my own timing. I also set my own deadline within one year. So I guess it's also scary because I do not know what people think after it's published. And I'm afraid there's error. So I got my ex-colleague, Law Mei Chi, to read through, proofread it. And she's very nice. She read through it and she edited my work. And also I give it to my ex-classmates and they look through for me as well. And that gave me more confidence along the way because at least a few people actually look through it. And going through, because it's a, it's a self-publishing book, I do not have the luxury of going through a publish, publisher. Publisher, it's easier because they do everything for you. They do the layout for you. They do the printing for you. They design for you. You just need to write the book. But as a self-publisher, I need to go through it. I need to find the printer. I need to find the designer. I need to submit the ISBN number. So it's, you should, it is more difficult for me, but it was challenging, but it gives me the experience of what it's like being a publisher. And probably, Crystal, you can also share. I'm, I'm sure you also have published a book and... What's it like doing your own publishing instead of getting a publisher to publish your book? It's, it's, also, it's also a bit like being your own fund manager, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everything you have to do yourself. You have to do yeah. it yourself. It's, it's pretty much uh, like learning and doing it at the same time. Yes. You experience it, you learn it, you do it. And at the same time, yes. you uh, through that experience, you get better. So I'm sure yes. now, you, now that you've written your first book, I am yes. sure you feel like, wow, it's a relief, right? Finally, it's published. It's out there. It's on Shopee. So for those of you who are watching, uh, if you want to check out her book, it's also on Shopee for you to buy. But if you are smart, you are going to put your comments and questions in the comment box uh, below so that you can win her books. Okay, so I see some questions coming in. So great. So we're going to pull those questions up. And Usha asks, in, is Malaysian market still attractive to invest? What is your view about USA or Singapore markets? Good one, Usha. <laughs> well, I think, um, of course, USA, US market and Singapore market did fairly well this year compared to Malaysian market. Our market is down by 8 to 9% this year. If I'm not mistaken, I just checked Dow Jones is up like 20% this year, year to date. And in terms of valuation-wise, our market PE, is below 15 times, about 14 times, if I'm not mistaken. And Dow Jones is about more than 20 over times. So valuation-wise, our market is cheaper. So if you think that because our market is bad, maybe it's time to enter for a long-term basis. I, I, for one, like Malaysia, despite even though it's not a very good market to invest this year, because by being a Malaysian in a Malaysia setting, I know when to enter and exit better than a US market. Well, US or even Singapore market, I'm not there. I don't know the company that well. And if it's US market, when the market is open, I'm sleeping. So basically, it's not where that we invest that's important. It's whether we make money out of it. Even if the market is not good, you don't you realize that not every stock is on a downtrend. There are some stocks that is still on the uptrend. So it's more difficult to find a gem in the bad market, in a bearish market, but it doesn't mean that you cannot find it. And for instance, if you want to do a business, would you find it easier to do a business in Malaysia, easier than doing a business in US or Singapore? Because you know Malaysian market better. You know the target market better. You have a better feel of the market. You have a better feel of the company and the industry. And that's very important. If I want to set up a business in Malaysia, it's easier for me because I know how to get in and out and I have the connection. And even the source of information in Malaysia is easier because being a Malaysian is easier. 
So it's not where I invest that is important. It's whether I can make a money, I make my money grow that is important. So sometimes it looks very cool to invest overseas. But if you ask them, it doesn't mean that the market is up, they make money. So to me personally, I feel that it's okay to invest in Malaysia. And as I mentioned, Malaysia market is very low. Most of the stocks, some of the stocks are trading below 10 times PE at historical low. Foreign funds is also all time low. So if, if the foreign funds start to come back, we will see the market to rally in a big way. When? I wouldn't know. It's anyone's guess. But what I can foresee is that not just the low valuation, our market, the dividend yield is so high. Some of the some of the stocks are trading, uh, the dividend yield is about more than 5%. And it's quite easy to easily easily found in Bursa. So if you have a long-term view and you, you still believe there's a recovery in Malaysian market, I think it's not too bad to buy in a bearish market and keep it for a long-term basis. This is, a, just, is, this is just my personal view of the Malaysian market compared to US market and Singapore market. I think Malaysia is still a good place to buy. It's really undervalued. And Thanks. Yeah. Is, are there, is there more? Because we have a couple more questions. We have three, two more questions coming in. The other thing I wanted to also mention, I uh, remember Meijing, you were telling me that Bursa also has some free courses available, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. There, so think the, Bursa Academy, I think you can go and Google Bursa Academy. There are some free courses online. So yeah, go go and check it out. It's free. Um, nowadays, there are a lot of free courses. So it's very hard for a trainer to survive. But it's also a good thing. I mean, um, good thing in the sense that uh, more people are aware of how to improve their knowledge in uh, stock selection and better financial literacy. And so check out Busa Academy. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's quite easy to find uh, yeah, that, courses that free or courses online. Yeah. yeah. Because of you, I remember when we were talking, you told me about Bursa Academy. So I went and actually checked it out and said, wow, interesting also, because I didn't know uh, there were these free courses, right? Yeah. That was uh, like teaching people how to invest. I think it's this the one. Let me and see. the speakers are quite good. They are usually from reputable banks. Hmm. They are certified. So they also don't simply yeah. give advice. Okay. So we are put it in the comments so anybody is interested they can go and check it out so this is really uh useful information that i didn't i myself didn't know about so i've put it out in the comments okay let's get to the other question by leong for a layman can you suggest where to find information when researching a company ah i think Meijing covered this in one of her slides maybe First thing you can Google the person. You just like when okay, Google the company. <laughs> just like how you Google a person, you Google the company. Yeah. Like what is Redbox Studio? You just Google what is Redbox Studio. Yeah. Well, while saying that, uh, those of you who are watching, please follow and like us because yeah. we do we do this because we just want to share good information. So please follow and like us wherever you're watching so, this from, whether you're LinkedIn or YouTube or Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Find out what is Redbox Studio. Yeah. Google Crystal Crystal. <laughs> I'm not a stock to be one, but yeah, you no, I mean, I mean, want to. So, 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 I mean, it's just an example. Yeah. For a layman, he was just asking. Yeah. So, Google. And I'm sure there are a lot of comment. Even Redbox Studio also have a lot of comment. Yeah. Then, then you can discuss with your friends. Hey, what do you find out? You know, you know, in the invest, in the, in the corporate world, there's an investment committee for fund management. So we have to discuss why we buy this particular stock or why we sell this particular stock. So we basically, we have to justify our reason why we are there. Lah. Hmm. Justify why, why this stock is worth a buy. So you can discuss with your friend when you want to buy a stock. Hey, what do you find out about this company? Maybe I and Crystal go and find out about a particular company. Hey, tell me what's your research finding. And then I also tell you my research finding. And then we argue about it. Lah. Then we come up with a conclusion, buy or, buy or sell. <laughs> I think so. So now you mentioned a very interesting uh, part of it. So does it mean that it's better to invest with a group? I mean, like not with a group of friends. Meaning that you have a group of friends, 
who are similar with similar interests that wants to invest easier for you to have discussions about certain stocks and certain things that you should or shouldn't do is that a good thing or a bad thing i think it's depend on individual who are who you are discussing with as well mm. Mm. i hope the person you discuss with is rational and objective enough to <laughs> analyze the stock in an objective okay. manner if okay. the fellow is very attached to the stock there's no mm. point discussing with the person because that person has only one view so Which this is, is just my buy like which is a one we miss yeah, yeah, i, I yeah. love this stock just buy keep buying yeah. doesn't matter there's no risk of, there's no risk on it <laughs> which is wrong i mean every stock has a risk every business has risk okay yeah i hope this answers your question leon but for me okay from a digital point of view these days no matter whether you're buying a stock or not if you want to know more about someone or something or a company or a product <laughs> the best way is still to google right Google yes. is your best friend. Go and Google everything. Good, bad, you know, forums, people are talking on Facebook groups, whatever it is. Join certain groups where people are talking about certain things and then you can find out more about the company and take everything that you read and look at it objectively. So I think whether or not you're buying a stock doesn't matter. You still have to be objective about all your research online and uh, take everything add, that you can. Stock. Yeah, I want to add that you can Google, um, you can go to Busa Malaysia website and there's annual report there and there's financial mm -hmm. statement there. Hmm. Yeah, so you can actually do more research from Usa Malaysia website and find out about the company. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then thank you, Leong, for your question. Um, and this is Grace Anne's question. Just came in, not sure if anyone asked, what's your personal opinion on warrants? Um, I don't, I'm not an expert in warrants, to be frank. Can, can we define warrants, uh, first of all, so that, you know, people um, don't know? Well, it's a right. Oh, I don't have a right definition for it. It's okay, like let me, let me try and Google you buy, it. You buy something at the yeah, you buy something what? at the at the price at a strike price, and it gives you to buy a, a share at a certain price. Hmm. So there's a, a call warrant and put warrant. Okay, so what I found was um. In finance, a warrant is a security that entitles the holder to buy the underlying stock of the issuing company at a fixed price. Yes. Called exercise price until the expiration date. Warrants and options are similar in that the two contract, contractual financial instruments allow the holder special rights to buy securities. Um, I think it's important to, when you buy warrant, is not too near expiry because the warrant can be expired can be, can be near expiry when we buy too near expiry then it becomes worthless so it had to be buy make sure that it's in the money um not out the money and uh, so i think you have to do your own calculation in buying the warrant so you must know what you're buying and you cannot just buy because it's cheap but you have to calculate the price of the warrant before you enter into a trade okay I think she has another question. Grace Anne has two questions. What is the appropriate amount of time to spend while researching stocks? Thanks, thanks for tagging your friends, uh, Grace. There is that no is... appropriate time, actually. Hmm. But what's important is that if you know the stock is good, you have to enter at the right time. Don't wait for things to happen. Just say you know that property is a good property. And you still want to wait and wait and wait. People will grab it first if at a good pricing. So time wait for no man. Uh, there's no appropriate timing actually. Even at night you can do researching, whatever time you want to do. But it doesn't mean that you do a lot of research. Then you definitely make money from the, from the from the stock. Some people can do research day in day out, but still make the wrong decision. So it's very important that. Um, how to say? Basically, there's no right or wrong. How many, how many, how much time you want to spend on on researching the stock? It's just like how much time you want to spend doing that particular business. Is there a time? There, there, there is no time. It's very flexible. So long as you understand what you understand what you are buying. That's my advice. Yeah, understand what okay. you're buying. Okay. So thank you. We are uh, at the top of our hour. We're actually four minutes past the hour. So for those who have asked their questions. I can safely say that we will, uh, you'll be winners. Lah. We are very kind, right, Mei Ching? 
the people yes. who ask their questions, especially yes. those very interesting ones. So congratulations, Usha. Congratulations, Grace and Leong. Yeah, I think Leong. Yes, sure. Leong asked a question. Grace and Leong, and is Leong. it? Yeah, okay. these three sure. persons. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, you Asmi. Just... Even even though Leong and Usha did not tag, but I think it's okay, lah. We know we just we just want to be, uh, kind and we want to share your book with them, right? So oh, sure. Usha, yeah, Usha, Leong, and Grace. Uh, what you need to do is uh, well, you need to email me actually. <laughs> you need to email me, so I'll give you my email. Okay, so this is the email. Please email me and uh, email me with your address and your phone number and of course your full name because uh, Mei Ching will send the book, post the book directly to you. And that is your gift for early Christmas gift from Mei Ching to, to all of you who asked some very interesting questions tonight. And I hope that this will also uh, give you an insight into investing. I'm, I'm sure, Grace, since you asked such a, I would say, a little bit more advanced question, maybe you're already very familiar with it. But whatever it is, enjoy reading uh, Mei Ching's book because it does have some wonderful examples. And I think she gave her own examples, right? Your own example of also like how how, how you invest and, and what you look for and some of the very cute examples that she gave. So this is... Uh, our gift to you from myself and Mei Ching for being uh, participants in today's uh, show. Let me see, there's a comments here. Uh, any, any more comments? Oh, okay. So Grace says thanks. No, thank you, Grace. Thank you, Usha, and thank you, Leong. And for the, shall we, shall we be kind, Mei Ching? I want to give, shall we also give to these two other persons, which I felt that also asked a good question. Ong? Sure. Oh, Ong sure. WS. Okay. Ong WS. I uh, don't know whether you're male or female, but you're a winner too tonight. And Tony Pang. Sure. Can I? So, Can. so our, Can. our, our uh, guest today is very generous. So thank you so much for uh, sponsoring your books and giving everyone a chance to win and read your book so that they can start investing in 2022 or at least have some idea what they want to invest in by after reading your book. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Um, for those of you who want to share this, please do share it with your friends. Uh, and of course, uh, if they're interested in Meijing's book, please uh, find it on Shopee. Uh, for those who didn't win it, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you have to buy it from Shopee, from Meijing. Shopee the title account. is Be Your Own Fund Manager. Yeah. Yes, Be Your Own Fund Manager. Let me, let me pull, out, pull it up again. So that It's also available in MPH at the moment. MPH, Grab Budaya, uh, Kinokuniya, right? Yes. Yeah, so all these uh, bookstores, uh, you can get it physically or you can buy it online directly. So thank you, everyone. Um, before we go, thank you so much uh, for those of you who have joined us over and over again for the last 40 episodes. I'm very thankful uh, to have you with me. I'm very thankful that I get to interview all these wonderful people on my show. And I'm going to take a break until end of this year, which is actually another two more weeks. Take a break so that I can come back with even more interesting live stream. So if you have something that you want to learn about or something that you feel that uh, I should have a guest on to talk about that particular topic. Please uh, let me know in the comments too what kinds of topics they're looking for. And let me try and find that perfect guest to come and talk about it and help us, uh, you know, understand a little bit more about that topic. But next year, I'm also going to talk a little bit more about the things that I do. So if you want, I want to do it. Ask me anything at AMA. Ask me anything about digital, about website development and all that. I mean, feel free to do that because a lot of people ask me, why don't you do one just talking about the industry that you're in and the business that you're in and say, yeah, let me consider that. So anyway, for those of you who have won, uh, please email me, info at robotstudio.com and give me your name, your address and your phone number and I'll forward this to Mei Ching and she will post the books out to you. Hopefully you get them before Christmas. So it is your personal Christmas gift from Mei Ching and me. So thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good night. And uh, we will see you in 2022. <laughs> Happy New Year and Merry, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year, everyone.
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.